This program is made possible by a grant from the Maryland Humanities Council. Francine Duplessis Gray talks with David Levering Lewis. Welcome to The Writing Life. I'm Francine Duplessis Gray, and uh, we'll be talking today with the distinguished historian David Levering Lewis, author of seven books, which include a biography of Martin Luther King and a work on the Dreyfus Affair entitled Prison of Honor. His very last book, the first volume of his monumental biography of the Afro-American scholar and activist W.E.B. Du Bois, broke all records by gleaning the three most distinguished prizes awarded for the writing of history, the Pulitzer, Parkman, and Bancroft Prizes. Welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, in what way did your biography of um, W.E.B. Du Bois or in what way is it revising, because it is still in process, there will be a second volume expected in a year. In what way, in what major ways is it revising earlier views of Du Bois, both as his carrying the point of view of his character and of his career as an activist? Um, it uh, probably uh, is, is less uh, revisionist than it is uh, completing. Uh, the, uh, the life of Du Bois is, is a multifaceted one that touches upon, oh, I think virtually any issue of consequence uh, uh, during much of this century. Uh, and so it's been a matter of simply tracking Du Bois as he uh, has an impact upon and reacts to uh, major uh, issues of feminism, of socialism, of uh, civil rights, of uh, indeed historiography. Uh, and doing that through the uh, enormous correspondence uh, that he left behind as well as uh, primary and other secondary materials. Uh, I probably in the personal uh, domain though uh, am uh, making a contribution uh, because there has been an iconic uh, texture to much of the uh, appreciation of Du Bois. And he turns out to have been uh, uh, quite a uh, uh, quite a complex man who uh, knew that he would have biographers and therefore set traps for them. Uh, he uh, was a master at reconstructing history so plausibly that you never suspected that, uh, in fact, uh, these things, if not, uh, uh, that, that he reports, uh, if, if not fanciful, are in fact uh, manufactured for the purpose of enhancing his posterity. I, I don't mean to suggest that he was in any way fraudulent, uh, but that Du Bois... Self-mythologizing, would you say? Uh, uh, yes, yes. And so I've been especially attentive to, to that aspect of his life, and I hope I've, uh, I've unmasked a great deal of the, uh, the um, um, stage management of uh, <laughs> his life uh, done by him. Um, since W. E. Du Bois had strong opinions about just about everything that was occurring in American culture in his time, uh, how do you feel he would look on the general racial situation in the United States today in 1995? And how would he look in particular on such current issues as the Million Man March and the aftermath reactions to the O.J. Simpson verdict. Well, you've just, I think, given us another program, uh, Francine. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and there's a good deal, a bit of prophecy entailed in part of your question, and I, I, I'm a little chary of, uh, of speculating of, upon what um, um, uh, uh, a, a person would think of events long after he or she is, is gone. Um, I, I think, though, that uh, what we would want to say about Du Bois is that the, the economic content of any social phenomenon uh, for him was of uh, paramount importance. And so his judgment, his appreciation or assessment of, of an event, of an, att of an attempt, of, of an undertaking would be, what's it going to mean in terms of the distribution of income? What's it going to mean in terms of the empowerment of ordinary men and women? Uh, what about opportunities for equality based upon uh, a march? 
uh, a, a piece of legislation. Uh, and he would, I think, scrutinize the recent uh, Million Man March, certainly in those terms, and wonder beyond the spectacle and beyond the poignancy of bonding uh, and the fine statement that those 800,000 odd men made, uh, what the sequel uh, must and should be. And there I think he would, uh, he would be somewhat perplexed. Uh, and perhaps indeed uh, a sense of uh, a puzzlement would, uh, would be propelled by the atonement theme uh, of the march. Uh, in a sense, uh, victims were atoning for their sins, he might say. That is to say, uh, of course, he would also, uh, parenthetically, uh, be concerned about the exclusion of women from the march, whatever the, raison, the rationale, being a feminist, a militant feminist. But I think he would, uh, he would wonder if it was atonement that was appropriate that day, or whether uh, a claim against uh, the uh, uh, establishment might have been uh, uh, more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where do you think he would situate himself within the current uh, field of uh, African-American culture and politics? Do you think he'd be, be more likely to hang out with uh, Charlie Rangel or um, with you or with uh, Cornell West or with Skip Gates, who all represent rather distinct sectors of the African-American culture? I don't know what sector I'm, I might be uh, 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 thought to represent, but I would like him to hang out with me simply because it would be awfully good company for me. <laughs> yes. uh, he, um, I, I, I suppose with, with politicians were not Du Bois's favorite uh, types, and so with all due respect to uh, Congress uh, person Wrangell, probably not. He might give him a pass. I think he would be uh, 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 enchanted by the kind of protean uh, uh, productivity of uh, Henry Louis Gates, uh, professor of history at, uh, of uh, literature at Harvard, and a contributor regularly to the New Yorker magazine, and an editorialist, essayist. He would find him, I think, uh, in, in engrossing. Uh, what he would say about specifics of ideas, uh, I'm uh, not, uh, not, not so sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And how would you think he would look on the potential presidency of uh, General Colin Powell? Well, this really is punditry now, and uh, uh, my crystal ball uh, is, is a little cloudy. Again, I think I would uh, think that he would wonder what the real meaning of the candidature is. And he, with his uh, skew on politics, take on politics, would I think not find the Republican agenda and the contract on or with or for America uh, something that uh, was uh, uh, positive. And so to the extent that General Powell uh, inches in the direction of accepting or being invited to be either the, the standard bearer or the second on the ticket, uh, insofar as that uh, ideology or that uh, position of the party is not uh, ameliorated, softened, and brought somewhat leftward, I think he would uh, he would not be uh, uh, not be um, uh, find, find the candidacy appealing, however appealing the man himself. He might be wary. He would probably prefer a, a third party candidacy. I think so. I think so. Yeah. He, after all, uh, supported Henry Wallace in that yeah. last turning point option we have had in American politics in 1948. Uh, yes, I don't know that this third party option with the Perot uh, group would uh, would uh, appeal to him. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty complex. Unfortunately, since I'm an historian, I don't have to give yes. accurate answers. In yes. fact, I shouldn't answer at all, <laughs> I suspect. Um, let's talk more technically about the writing of biography in general. It strikes me that one of the most important things a biographer has to do is very soon, within his first pages, initiate a kind of pact of trust between himself and the reader. Of course, this is uh, something which has to be done in all literary works, uh, including fiction and essays. How would you say you go about creating a pact of trust with the reader when you are writing about a figure as complex as, uh, the, uh, du, as du Bois? I think uh, it's a no-holds-barred uh, enterprise. Uh, you become increasingly invested in the life of your, your person. Uh, and there are times when disappointments can be quite bitter. 
and there's a temptation to protect the person, to protect his luster. I think one must resist that always. I think one must be ruthlessly uh, candid. I don't like the word objective because it, in a sense, is meaningless, but insofar as it has meaning, abide by its dictates. Uh, because in the end, uh, the character is stronger. I uh, wrote uh, what was uh, the first scholarly biography of Martin Luther King many years ago, about 25 years ago. Uh, and there were a number of aspects of uh, the life that I, I couldn't say a great deal more about simply because the documentary uh, evidence was, uh, was not then forthcoming. But I had my suspicions, uh, and I felt that I needed to hint that there were in his life revelations to come which would be troubling, and so they have come. Uh, and if I were to have written that book later when the documentation was to hand, I think I would have explored it fully because I would have believed, as with Jefferson, as with any uh, figure, that the accomplishment, the public accomplishment, is after all what is significant. We yeah. can't take that away from yeah. them. But to appreciate how difficult it may have been for them to become themselves, or how having become themselves they really nonetheless uh, deserve themselves, uh, is the, 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 the special gift that the mm -hmm. biographer can bring mm -hmm. to the, uh, the general appreciation yeah. of what yeah. lives and times are, are about and should Tell us a bit more about your intellectual formation. What led you, what do you think incited you to turn to French history after you'd finished, well, as a matter of fact, it was the, the thesis of your doctorate, was it not? And what was the nature of your doctoral dissertation? How do you view that period in your life when you turn your interest to French history? Uh, you know, that's a question that I have no ready answer for. It, it always seemed to me self-evident that French history was enormously fascinating and complex. Uh, and uh, so uh, I found that in my early years uh, in a family where French was uh, spoken that uh, it, uh, it informed my understanding of, uh, of American history. Uh, and I suppose uh, the opportunity to live in France uh, had something to do with the selection of the, uh, of the, uh, the kind of studies I pursued. Uh, and the dissertation I did, my goodness, I hadn't thought about that in years. What was it? It had something to do with uh, the crisis in French liberal Catholicism uh, in the interwar period with special attention to the Esprit group and Emmanuel Mounier. Oh, yes. And uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because yes. what fascinated me was beyond uh, Mounier and his group, and it was a fascinating group of uh, ex Catholic and, existentialists. And us. Yes, yeah. uh, was the uh, enterprise of combining uh, Catholic uh, doctrine and Marxism, uh, covertly enough, uh, not to fall under the censure of uh, those who scrutinize oh, this. And I thought that was a fascinating uh, yes. uh, in, endeavor. And I suppose that there's been a kind of consistency in, in my uh, writing of, of history and biography that, that I look for those tensions where uh, principles and pragmatism or the squaring of differences uh, uh, is, uh, is, the, uh, is the, the, the effort uh, uh, to, be, to be described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what in particular led to you to uh, write your second book on, um, on the Dreyfus Affair? That came after the, uh, the King book, and the King book was really a, a lark in the sense that uh, a, a Penguin editor whom I had known in England persuaded me to, uh, to write it, uh, just as I was in fact writing another sort of book in French history. Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the, there, there's a f famous cache of documents uh, uh, in the military archives in France at the Chateau de Vincennes called the Dossier Secret never seen by anyone except one person, the uh, curator of manuscripts at the, uh, at the Bibliothèque Nationale, Monsieur Marcel Thomas in those days. And I wanted to see what was there. And I was the second person to gain access to those documents, which were the fabricated documents that the army had prepared just in case Dreyfus was going to be uh, rehabilitated. But it turned out that they were so badly done that they uh, couldn't and shouldn't have been used. They couldn't be destroyed, and so they were locked away. Mm -hmm. And uh, they uh, give a particular tincture to that whole mm -hmm. uh, brilliant, seamy uh, story. Did they involve Esther Hazy? 
Uh, these uh, did, but what the, they were more of a, of a, of a moral nature to, yes. uh, to yes. undermine uh, sure. some of the cast of characters. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, to get back to the national scene, um, do you find uh, that uh, the tensions and divisions within the Afro-American community today, how do you compare them to the tensions uh, in the African-American community in the first decade of the century when, when the great division between Booker T. Washington's leadership and uh, Du Bois' leadership was already making a considerable cleavage. How would you compare that kind of division to what exists today? <clears throat> the um, division of, of the turn of the century uh, does have echoes, it, it seems now, because I think the, the, the uh, debate between Du Bois and Washington beyond personality and temperament uh, of ideas had to do uh, with class. Du Bois represented an urban, urbanizing, um, uh, fairly well-educated uh, population, minuscule, of course, demographically, and Washington represented uh, the, the South in all of its realities and the compromise needed. Uh, it seems to me, and so what they said, they said because of the uh, constituencies they were trying to, uh, to privilege. We have that same kind of fissure now uh, as one-third of the African-American population moves into the mainstream, uh, albeit very, very uh, fragile in its, uh, in its uh, achievements, and we have this vast uh, underclass or uh, uh, group of, uh, of people who are not making it and are, are even more, uh, more, more savagely uh, impacted. Uh, <clears throat> and the crisis, however, reflects itself in a kind of mutism which was not present at the beginning of the century, which is curious. That is to say, those people who are the talented tenth, it seems today, are deferring to the crisis by silence and accommodation uh, and uh, perhaps fear that to speak with certain voices risks to be co-opted by the very people one needs to oppose, and a sense of guilt, perhaps, that having left that community, uh, they must not judge it, uh, but indeed affirm it by silence or by indulgence. And so we have moral dilemmas that uh, they've always been there uh, that are especially acute now, it seems, because this is the very moment, it seems to me, when uh, a, a turning point uh, is presenting itself, and without the proper uh, vigorous, robust input of uh, those people who look towards the long uh, 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 whole in history. Uh, without their input, we're likely to uh, have responses to crises that are instantaneous, that are psychic, uh, uh, that are um, pathological even. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, though the, the class divide is even greater than it was at Du Bois's time, uh, the cl one class, it seems, uh, has decided to, uh, <laughs> to remain rather invisible. Uh, what could you further define the nature of the turning point that you're presently uh, uh, encountering in the African American community? In its simplest terms, it seems to me uh, that uh, 10 or 12 percent of the population has to be mindful of just that fact, uh, and that uh, if there are serious systemic problems, the only way to address them, to grapple with them, is in co uh, cooperation and collaboration with others whose economic interests uh, somewhat correspond. And I, I mean, others of, of non-African Americans. Of non-African Americans. I see, a, 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 so a pan-poverty pan yeah. The whole ball of wax of gender issues yeah. and class issues and economic issues, all of those things, it seems to me, have to uh, uh, be stitched together. Uh, and uh, what is happening now is rather the withdrawal, uh, apparently, of uh, African Americans from that activity in a kind of uh, um, morality play in which, having suffered so, uh, we have a right indeed to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 privilege our, our, our history as, as victims. Well, that's all well and good, but uh, history can only give you so long a ride. And at some point, it seems to me, one has to uh, look at what the problem is, which is a problem that goes quite beyond slavery or color, mm -hmm. and has to uh, do with the way industrial democracies are functioning. 
Uh, there is a report uh, just out by a Luxembourg study group that shows that the uh, inequality in <clears throat> the United States and in income is greater than in any industrial democracy and getting rapidly much greater, whereas in other countries, uh, Portugal, uh, Canada, uh, uh, Italy, in fact, uh, the gap is uh, uh, not widening and certainly not widening in Britain and France at, at that rate. This is, it seems to me, the root of the problem of the period. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, until groups, blacks, and uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, middle class that uh, is uh, fraying uh, begin to talk in those terms, it seems that wedge politics will continue mm -hmm. to give uh, us a national agenda uh, which uh, is uh, disproportionately mm -hmm. beneficial to uh, the, uh, the super rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One last question. In a recent uh, article in the New Yorker magazine, Henry Louis Gates, your colleague, um, interviewed um, a dozen or so leaders of the, of the upper tenth, <laughs> of the town of tenth, uh, in, in the African com uh, American community. And almost all of them uh, told of specific acts of discrimination they had suffered, such as Earl Carroll was the most has the highest position in publishing of any African-American country, head of Pantheon Books, uh, 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 describing how when he once rented a Bugatti at the Miami airport to, mm. you know, for three days vacation, uh, he constantly became, he was arrested by the police because they just didn't see why this African-American was driving that expensive a car. Mm -hmm. Now, have you, in your own life, and you as self-describing yourself as an Afro-Saxon, <laughs> as integrated with the white community as an African-American can be, have you also encountered that kind of discrimination or any kind of the, of the sort that is described by Skip Gates in that article? Uh, not, not driving a Bugatti, no. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I, 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 I have. The, an the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, and it, it, I think it's, 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 it's healthy that we now have this genre of, uh, of uh, uh, personal, uh, of, of memoirs about uh, how I became an American through overcoming a lot of indignations and uh, indignities and uh, not uh, being able to uh, have a taxi in New York seems to be the, the standard plaint of uh, people who uh, can quite well afford Bugattis. Uh, and as I say, that, that's, uh, that I think that's a phase. The uh, Jewish community uh, was uh, uh, particularly uh, vivid, it seems to me, in earlier uh, uh, decades in talking about what it meant to be Jewish in America and how it wasn't always a bed of roses coming out of uh, uh, the East End and so on. Uh, so it's an important uh, cultural record to have that. Uh, Hispanics will soon begin to do it, uh, yes. But um, <coughs> I have to say, so what? Uh, because, in fact, most ethnic groups have, uh, have been a bit bruised about. Uh, and so uh, beyond the anecdotal interest of that, it seems to me we now need a literature of rhetoric and a concern about, I hate to sound uh, uh, like a John One note, economic issues. Uh, it is, after all, a question of class, it seems to me, that bedevils us, in which race exacerbated uh, certainly a major factor, and gender, to be sure, a major factor. Uh, white uh, male unrest uh, certainly has everything to do with the, uh, the, uh, the, the rise of women and, and their rights, uh, but behind that is always economics. Do women go out? Do we have a national daycare uh, uh, funded by taxes? And if so, what does that mean? Thank you so much, thank you, David. Francine. Wonderful. It, it was great. It was a pleasure. And thank you so much to our audience for watching The Writing Life. I think that the um, it's <laughs>